I'm, I'm Dan Doe, and I co-host these uh, events with Dave Kravitz and Mark Cohen. Um, we were lucky enough for him to get us you tonight. Yep. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. Very kind. So yeah. what we're going to do is uh, Dave's going to kick it off, but just to kind of give everyone some ground rules, if you're not new to this, most of you have been on a lot of these at this point, so that's good. Um, we're going to have you speak. Oh, he, he now, he's, muted. now he's muted. <laughs> now he's muted. Oh, great. All right. We're, we're going to have you speak for about 40, 45 minutes, roughly. And then Mark is going to take questions from chat. So basically, it's on your life experiences, the MBA, all that kind of good mm -hmm. stuff. That's really what we're looking for. You know, it's your life. People ask you, it's your life. We want to know about you. <laughs> we want to know about the MBA. Good. That's what we want. And mm -hmm. the stories and the interviews and you, you know things we'll never know. So that, that, that kind of thing. And, and the book you have coming out in May. In the book. We want to know about the book for also. Sure, for because sure. I have a team that, want, sure. that I think should tank right now. Well, that's another issue. We want to go. We'll talk about that later. Sounds good. All right. So you want, you want 40, 45? I was told more 30, yeah. 35. And you can do whatever, do, what you, whatever do what you're, you're comfortable 30, 35 with. 35 is fine. If, because I expect to get okay. a lot of questions. I mean, I can sit here and ask you questions all night long, but that's another issue. Yeah, then, I, I, t I mean, I, I typically do a more of a question and answer format. So yeah, we can get to that. I, 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 I can give a nice opening okay. spiel for you guys. It gets out of control. All right, we ready to go? Danny? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Okay, here we go. All right. So okay. it's I'm going to it's my privilege to wait, wait, wait. Well, Mark, let me do the introduction for you. Oh, yeah, you gotta do your, your, your spiel. I have to do my spiel. Hold on, Mark. Okay. Well, we have a good one for you tonight. Hello, and welcome to the Sports Affinity webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you a unique and valuable opportunity to be part of something bigger than yourself, while also allowing you to feel significant and accepted for being just as you are. In our emails, we have started including instructions on how to add the FJMC public Google calendar to your own calendar, as well as a link to download a single event file that you can be used to add one event to your calendar. I'm Dave Kravitz with my co-host, Jenny Mando. We'll be hosting tonight. We're going to mute everyone, and then we'll be unmuting so the presenter can take questions. And that will be in chat, only in chat. If you are enjoying our webinars, please validate your support with a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. We'll put the link in chat. Click on an honor of, and then select affinity groups or webinar. So first I'll introduce Mark Cohen. Mark is the Mid-Atlantic Regional President, soon to be an FJMC International Vice President at our convention. So now, Mark Cohen, take it away. Uh, thank you, David and Danny, for, um, for letting uh, me uh, find you uh, a good person um, for your uh, affinity group, which, by the way, these have been really, really great, some really great speakers, and we're just going to add another one to it. So Jake Fisher is a, um, is a Cherry Hill boy. Um, and, uh, he, from my old synagogue, Bethel, my sister still goes there, but I don't go there anymore. Uh, Jake comes from really good stock. His parents are, um, very, very generous, um, uh, people in the community, JNF, um, over here as well. Um, so they're really all great people, but Jake has a gift and Jake, uh, went to Northwestern. Uh, Northeastern, excuse Northeastern, me. Northeastern, Northeastern, Northeastern. Boston, <laughs> Northeastern in Boston. It's a common, um, it's a common mistake, man. Common it's mistake. Fair. He's a Philly boy, you know, and then he went to Boston. Eh, now he's in New York. Um, Jake has been writing for the NBA, uh, about the NBA since what, 2013, like, even a little bit before then as well? Um, 2013, yeah. Yeah, see, I, I do my homework. Um, <laughs> He's written for Sports Illustrated, for, um, oh gosh, um, Slam Magazine. And in May, he has his book coming out, which is Built to Lose, How the NBA Tanking Era Changed the League Forever, um, which you'll be able to get on, order on Amazon, and I'll, we'll put the link in later. But um, Jake um goes into the into the clubhouses into the locker rooms 
He has a lot of great, great, great stories of, of talking to players and coaches. And so Jake's going to tell us a little bit about himself and what he does and how he does it. So Jake, welcome. Take it away. All right. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate that. Um, we're up to like 50 plus people now. So I appreciate everyone for coming. Um, it's been... I, it's, I don't love having all this attention on myself for the book. I kind of like to do all my work privately and I like, put my head down and have these conversations with people. Um, so bear with me as I'm in the beginning of this media tour, but um, I, I'm really happy to be here. And I thank you, Mark, for setting this up um, before we go any further. So without that, you know, starting from there, um, I think, you know, I get an email probably once a week from a kid or a young adult or whoever asking me, how did I get my start? How do you do what you do? So I think that's a pretty natural place to kind of begin the spiel and kind of work chronologically. Um, so yeah, as Mark said, you know, I grew up, I'm, I'm from Cherry Hill originally um, and was very, very fortunate that my dad had season tickets. For, I was very fortunate for a lot of reasons, many, many reasons, too many to count. Um, but one of them that's most important during all this is that my dad um, Peter had season tickets to the Sixers growing up and I was a huge basketball fan for sure um, playing probably from five on up and I definitely thought I had a little bit of talent and like knew the game pretty well to the point where I was always like the player that was talking with my coach the coach on the floor type of person um and being in the NBA, going to be a part of that Sixers team, um, not literally, but as a fan and, and pretty close up, thanks to my dad, it kind of helped me start to understand how a, a season operates, not just from the – like at first I was just a Sixers fan and a kid going to these games and wanting the chicken fingers and wanting the ice cream at halftime. And then I started to realize – how you know a trade would like I would I would take note about how different when a different when a certain team came into the arena, you know there'd be you know, a lot of Kobe jerseys every time the Lakers came around, or notice how different brands started to come into the stadium for different you know agreement type stuff. I wasn't like this seven year old thinking about that, but that was as I got older into high school, and I also had at that same time, I had a really great teacher who was actually part of my book is dedicated to um, my third and fourth grade teacher, Nicole Crawford, who taught me how to write and my high school journalism advisor, who we'll get to in a little bit, Greg Gagliardi, who taught me how to report. So while I was having this basketball kind of, you know, love affair through, you know, middle school up through high school, I also was falling in love with writing at the same time too. And my teacher, Nicole Crawford, to her uh, credit, you know, she knew I was kind of a confident kid and I was really not doing well. With, she was really big on harping peer editing and peer help and um, you know, working with your peers and your fellow students on your stories. And I was having a lot of trouble because a lot of recommendations, in my opinion, weren't good enough to help my story get better. That was the whole point. You were supposed to separate yourself from your thing, have somebody else look at it. And I remember to this day, not 100% clearly, of course, but at some point, um, my teacher told me that, you know, you are better at most of these kids. Um, but that doesn't mean you, like, you're, you don't have room to grow. So it was a lesson in humility, but it was also a lesson in like telling me that I was right. Like I thought I was really good at something and someone recognized it and gave me that empowerment to keep doing it. So I remember even when we got to and my mom, Betsy is on this call right now, I'm pretty sure. Um, she took me and my sister, I have a twin sister, Kaylee. Um, I, I'm, if I, I'm pretty sure I'm remembering this correctly. We did a tour, quote unquote, of my middle school, Rosa Middle School in Cherry Hill, um, right before the school year started. And we were going around, because that was our first year of actually um, not just having one teacher. We actually would go around and go to your math class and go to your English class. So they did this thing where all throughout um, middle school and high school, too, in Cherry Hill, you could go to school a day or two or a week before and kind of see where your classes are and map things out. And I remember doing that 
we walked right up to um, the eighth grade English teacher, Miss Holden, who was like the, the school newspaper advisor. I hadn't even started in middle school yet. And I had said, I said, they're like, I'm going to be a sports columnist at the paper, like this middle school paper that was a word document, eight pages long, it printed in the you know, school library, it wasn't anything big or anything to uh, really, you know, aspire to be, but I, I, just, I didn't care. I just wanted to write and I wanted to write about sports and, you know, growing up also in the middle of all this, our kitchen table, um, we always had our spots. My, my mom sat, um, for my position, my mom sat, it was, it was two, two seats on both sides and one seat at each head of the table. I sat, um, in like this bottom right corner from my perspective, my mom sat on the opposite left. There was a seat open in front of me. My sister was to my right at that head. My dad was to my left. And my brother was to the far left on that head of the table. And we would wake up a lot of mornings with a note from one of our parents or, you know, a, a present or something. And a lot of times my dad would leave a piece of paper um, a cutout or whatever of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Philadelphia Inquirer and he would leave a note saying you know great human interest story thought you would like this and um, I didn't know it at the time but I've come to realize more now that I come from two parents who are storytellers as much as they're everything that Mark said um, I think that's a, a core thing of who they are. And when we're hosting family friends on the porch at the beach or seeing people in synagogue or whatever, they're always telling stories. And that's something that's obviously been ingrained in me. And I think through that, I found a thought process that I've carried and I've just kind of believed that stories are also about people and emotion and their intellect and how they interact with other people and that all of that got really cemented when I did get to high school and I fortunately got involved with um, the program there east side which you know I was in high school from 2008 to 2012 and this year east side and Greg Gagliardi like they are still continuing their run of the best high school paper in New Jersey it's all like from before I got there until like this this year they just won it again so it's a dynasty, honestly, when you're, if we're talking about sports, like they have won 13 straight years or something like that. And it's turned out dozens of professional journalists from various different um, segments of the industry. Um, and it's just, it was, it was such an amazing, empowering um, experience with this guy who, by, I mean, by day, he pretty much taught um, the lowest level English class for high school seniors wasn't teaching the honors AP class. He was just helping these kids kind of even learn how to write a couple of sentences together, honestly. And he had energy at the end of the day at eighth period, like I never seen before to like run a newsroom, like it was a real newsroom that you've seen in any TV show, um, you know, on any type of, you know, whether it's um, something that's like really hard news or a sports thing, like he was in the middle of that bullpen, like assigning stories pushing back on us when we pitched him ideas and one thing he said then throughout all that also the most important lesson I think I learned from gags was stories are about people just like I'd already started to feel with my parents and from and again that's a lesson I think I learned and honed more years after um, but it was a, it was a common theme right and the other thing that gags really taught me in addition to that was that whenever you're reporting something you need to add something new you need to add something with your story that's going to provide more information on your subject matter, whether it be a person or a team or an ecosystem or an organization, or need to introduce a new thought in general with your access. And you know, when I got to college, I went to Northeastern, like Mark said, in Boston. Um, I was already still doing some stuff on my own. I, was, I had my own little blog at the time that blogspot.com actually just took down like a week ago, I found out, which was like pretty devastating. I mean, they're terrible. And it's probably better for my um, reputation that they be scrubbed from the internet. But like as a memento, um, it's a bummer that they're gone, but I was doing that. I was blogging a bit for the Huffington Post at the time, um, but I was still like trying to figure out what I was trying to do. I was, I was, when I got to college, I was more so 
still trying to like impersonate Bill Simmons was like really what I was trying to do at the time, um, which is pretty funny. He'll, he'll, he'll come back if we get there. Um, we'll see how long I can keep talking. We're at 15 minutes now. Um, but Bill Simmons was who I really was trying to be either Bill or like Stephen A. Smith um, was the columnist I read in the Inquirer, And I know there's a lot of Boston people on this call. I ended up working with Dan Shaughnessy a bunch um, when I went, when I got to the Globe in college, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but someone like that, someone who had humor, wit, I was really trying to impart my stamp on any conversation that those sports at the time, which is pretty ironic. That's the direct opposite of what I do now. Um, so with gags as knowledge, and when I got to college, I started realizing that reporting is not just having your opinion on something and being the loudest voice in the room it's having a, a press pass and access to a world that like there are 59 people now on this call not to brag but i'm the only one on this call i'm pretty sure who's been in an nba locker room pretty regularly um and that's a tool that i have not to flout and brag about and show people but it's to bring information and stories to people who don't have that access so that really got cemented to me in college, being that every every story that we were working on in class, I was already blogging for. And once I got to college, you know, I made my I made it a point that like I was going to be writing and moving my way up blogs. I, at the time, um, the Philadelphia Inquirer's Sixers beat writer, if there's any if there's any Harry Potter fans in the room, was kind of like the Defense Against the Dark Arts post. And Harry Potter, like for whatever reason, there was a theme throughout my life that the Philadelphia Inquirer's Sixers beat writer only lasted three seasons. That has since been debunked, but at the time that was the case. And they just hired this guy named Keith Pompey, who, as many people on this call probably know, is still the beat writer for the Inquirer. So I was like all in, like, I'm going to graduate. This is like the cocky 18 year old kid that I was. Three years from now, their beat's going to be open. I'm going to be graduating from college. And I am definitely getting a Sixers beat writing job. Like that was where my head was at. So I was trying to do whatever I could outside of class to, to get myself closer to that. And I was blogging for ESPN.com's True Hoop Network at the time um, through some of the blogging that I had done personally. I was just sending it to anybody I could find, which looking back, like I, I, a lot of my success was just people giving me an opportunity to talk to them or get the, get on their platform. Um, I was like the Huffington Post I was doing for a while. I ended up in, studying abroad, my actually my freshman year of college, the first semester through this January start program. And I was doing all this random little blogging stuff for the Huffington Post college section. And I had a teacher who studied abroad in London um, while she, she was she was teaching me while I was in London, but she as a student studied abroad in London back in 2001 while 9-11 happened. And when she came back from her trip abroad, she saw American flag pins and, and, and you know, nationalist you know, regalia that she hadn't really seen before. Apparently, I don't really remember, I was six or seven years old. Apparently, it was just like a cultural shift that she felt she wasn't a part of. And she went back to London and actually started doing like doctoral research on reverse, reverse, uh, reverse culture shock, excuse me. Um, and like, as a, as a study abroad student, everyone knows about culture shock as going there, but she hadn't, I hadn't really heard about it, the opposite. So I wrote a little thing about that. And fortunately, that, this is just a story about, you know, I was always trying to do stuff outside of the classroom. Fortunately, this guy, Adele Henderson was his name. I'm not even in contact with him anymore. Um, he used to be a writer at Slam Magazine, an editor, and he found that article that I wrote and thought it was an interesting concept, which is again, looking for new things like Gagley already taught me, looking for stories about people like what he reinforced that I had, you know, learned from, you know, my upbringing and my, my just in my DNA. Um, and he said, you know, I, this guy Dell said, I'm trying to start this program where I'm reaching out to students who want to be journalists um, and putting them in touch with, you know, veterans in the industry. We want to be a part of it and it didn't cost anything it was like sure why not so he put me in touch with um lang whitaker who was the editor-in-chief of slam magazine at the time he like pretty much resigned right after i interviewed with him there was no correlation um but that's just how it worked how it worked and um you know one thing 
that Lang said, you know, I did a whole Q&A with him about how he got his start and this and that. One thing at the end he said to me was, hey, man, reach out to me if you ever need anything. And I mean that. Like a lot of people in this industry are going to say to you, yeah, let me know if you need anything or here's my number, blah, blah, blah. Like that's not just a throwaway line. Like if someone gives you that key, they can't take it back. They might not answer your call, but they've said it. They've given you the opportunity to contact them. So that's something I've, I've taken with business, like, like job opportunities or even in my reporting. Like if someone gives me their phone number and they, or I, I talk, I mean, I cold call people a lot for stories. I did it for the book. I do it for my reporting all the time. Um, I use that to my advantage every single time someone says, you can call me again, I will absolutely call you again. So Lang hooked me up with an internship at Slam that summer, pretty much. He like got me in touch with people and I interviewed and told them everything that I was telling you, telling you guys now, probably in a more stuttery and nervous fashion. Um, but they brought me on and that Slam thing, you know, Mark said I started covering the NBA professionally or covering it in 2013. That internship is when I count starting it because um, I wasn't a full-time writer at that point, but I was in the headquarters of this magazine that I was subscribed to since I was in fifth grade. And when that magazine would come in my mailbox or at my parents' house every month, I would read that thing cover to cover, like over and over again. Like my, my parent, I'd go to bed and we would have to it'd be like past my bedtime, quote unquote. And I would be, you know, with a flashlight or my lamp, like reading this magazine. And if I, once I read it, I'd be flipping through the pictures too. Now I was like interning there and I was so excited and I got there and they told me we have nothing really for you to do. Like this internship is kind of, you can make it what you want. Um, if you want to just sit here and do nothing all day until we walk by and have something for you to do, you can do that. But otherwise, you know, pitch stories, think about ideas, bring them to us. It's kind of as like a blank canvas. So it was at this weird period in the regular NBA calendar pre coronavirus, obviously. Um, but, the NBA calendar used to be very cyclical. So every May, there was this overlap in the NBA media landscape where the playoffs were still happening, but the draft season was very much occurring. All like there are less teams, or there are about even teams, actually, there's more teams that make the playoffs than don't, but there are 14 teams every year who don't make the playoffs. So while all these teams are still, you know, in these series and they're going back and forth on TNT and the post game shows are talking about, you know, different barbs guys are saying in the locker room, about half the league isn't focusing on that. And Slam wasn't either. So I, this is like, again, finding something new, finding people stories. This is an opportunity to capitalize on that. And I started going on the mock draft boards of Draft Express or whatever. Um, draft Express has since been acquired by ESPN. And I was going to players who were projected to be lower in the first round or in the second round, because the NBA draft only has two rounds, um, one through 30 and then 31 through 60. And I was trying to give press and opportunities to people who weren't the most hyped prospects. And through there, I stayed in touch with their agents. And I went to an event that the Nets were having. It was like a second round pick combine for all these prospects to come and have a showcase. And there was a player there that I interviewed previously. And I just treated him like a human, not treating him like, a big time player to like to fall over. I just want to say hi to him. And even just saying hi to him and like saying hello and checking in, a scout from the Sacramento Kings saw me having that conversation with him. I was 19 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. But this guy said to me, hey, you know, you know, DJ Steffens? He was this super athletic player from Memphis. There are college basketball fans on here who remember um, he like had super athleticism. He could like jump up and kiss the rim. Like, and like there's a whole picture of it. Um, so he was this athletic player that people were curious about, but he didn't have a real defined role. He's one of those tweener type players that he's not in the NBA anymore for this exact reason. He was athletic and intriguing, um, but people didn't really know how to forecast him. So in the draft, from GMs to low level scouts to the water guy on the equipment room, everyone's trying to get as much intel about these players to inform their decisions on who to draft. So this scout from the Kings came up to me, 19 year old intern at Slam and said, Hey, do you know, DJ Steffens? I'm interested in him. I'm trying to pitch him to my GM. Let's stay in touch. Now here's my number. If you like, the more you hear about DJ on his workout circuit, the more you hear about his personality, whatever, let me know. And that's when, that was my first real glimpse at realizing that the NBA is an ecosystem. There's players, there's agents, there's coaches, there's executives. 
And while I'm not an M- in the NBA, I'm definitely part of that ecosystem. And I have a role and that role has advanced over the years. Like now that I'm reporting rumors and stuff like that, um, I'm able to actually like give a front office, like actual real proprietary information that will help them in the trade deadline, which we'll definitely get to. Um, but that was my first glimpse at it. And, you know, agents started blowing up my phone, wanted me to write about their player and give them an opportunity and give them some exposure. And I took that summer and I wrote about 20 profiles on players. And um, I even like used airline points that I had saved up from like a family trip to fly down to Orlando and like put myself up in a hotel with money I made from working for my mom at uh, DJ bar mitzvah events and stuff like that. And like all unpaid and like, there's a big thing in the industry right now talking about unpaid internships and how they're not really fair for kids. Um, I would agree, but like at a certain point also, like I was in the door and I was, and I was lucky I had advantages that other kids might not necessarily have had. Um, but I was, I was using them to my advantage. Um, and I was there and I was on the ground as a 19 year old kid. And I met Sam Hinkey for the first time then. And that's kind of when I started actually like being at summer league in Orlando was when I really started to meet, meet people in the league. I mean, I used to hide talking about how old I was. Um, I would just help kids and people. I lived in Boston and I've always kind of looked older. I didn't lie about it, but I just, unless someone asked, I wasn't, I wasn't clear. Like I just was a guy writing for slam who lived in Boston was spending the summer in New York. So um, it just kind of snowballed from there. I, I ended up working at the globe a lot in college, working high school sports. Um, but I was always, the, the goal was always the NBA. And I got really lucky that, um, I mean, I went, I went to Northeastern first and foremost because they had this co-op program that um, it's a five-year program pretty typically. And every kid spends three different six-month segments working a full-time job rather than being in class. Um, someone at a career fair or at a uh, college uh, fair one day told me when I was making my decision that when you graduate from Northeastern, you get not just a diploma, but you get a resume too. And I was always super career focused. This is what I wanted to do, right? Back to my sixth grade, you know, taking the tour and telling Miss Halden before school started, I was going to be the columnist of the paper. This was my dream. So Northeastern was like the school to think about being, to think about your career and your path and your journey and yada, yada, yada. Um, so I, I, I have mixed feelings on Northeastern overall, I'm not going to lie, but that program I think is, you know, like none other. And I was able to work, like I worked at Slam through that and I worked at the Boston Globe through that. And my co-op advisor had a connection um, to BJ Schechter, who was the executive editor of SI.com at the time, a Northeastern alumni. And when I got back from my internship with the Globe covering high school sports and whatnot in Boston, um, she said, what do you want to do next? I said, I need to be at Sports Illustrated. Like, I don't know how it's going to happen, but like the type of reporting I want to do, you know, finding new stories about people who just happen to be in sports. Like there's no one who does it better than SI. And like, thank God that there was a connection that worked out. I mean, I met BJ because we, we had been emailing ahead of time, but also um, a professor brought him in to even talk to my class. And they got lunch afterwards. And he, I didn't even have like BJ, we, Mark messed up Northwestern Northeastern at the beginning. SI is like run with, with Northwestern alumni and BJ was Northeastern guy. So he always got ribbed on in the office and I did too, about not being a Northwestern person. So he just wanted someone at Northeastern in his office. And like, that was literally the only reason I got to SI. Like obviously I, you know, worked my, my butt off to try to get there. And like, I brought it when he asked me questions and like, if I was qualified for it, but I didn't, I wouldn't have gotten in the door if BJ didn't, you know, cross paths with me at the right time. So when I got to SI in New York, it was the same thing about at Slam. Honestly, they had nothing for me to do. And they said, no, we can give you busy work here and there, but this internship is going to be what you make it to be. And I did the same exact thing at Slam. I was doing that um, in between Slam and SI while I was with the Globe doing high school sports. Slam was credentialing me to go to Celtics games. Um, and write features for them, for their website. So like I would go to class and then I'd, sometimes I'd even go cover a high school game and then I'd go to the garden in Boston for slam with a credential and like be in the Celtics locker room and 
write stories. And the whole time, my whole approach was every single kid who likes sports and can write somewhat decently is trying to do this. And the only way I can do this and make myself stand out is to do stuff that does stand out. So I was always trying to find unique angles because like Gag said, you need to find something that no one else has heard before. And anyone can go to a game and tell you who won and how they did it. Not many people can, not to toot my heart again, can do what I do in, in terms of having genuine conversations with people and finding out, honestly, extracting information about their lives, about things that they do with other people and sharing that with the world. Just like I said at the top, like, I'm not usually someone who does this. I like to keep my head down. And like, I, I, for one, am very comfortable with the fact that I would not love my you know, personal details and information about me getting out there. There's a nuance to how you have conversations with guys to do that. Um, but, you know, I always approached it with like a funny zany thing. Like, you know, I know this isn't typically a question you would get, or I know this might sound silly or whatever, but I ended up finding out like really fun stories. Like I heard from someone that Mike D'Antoni, you know, an NBA coach, a lot of you probably know of, um, he was addicted to Starbucks from when he played in Italy, he loved cappuccinos back over there. And when he came here, like something at Starbucks was just the only thing that could, you know, come close to that Italian cappuccino he used to have. So like I got coffee with Mike D'Antoni and talked about how he was addicted to Starbucks and um, you know, a, a player named Miles Turner, a center with the Indiana Pacers was obsessed with Legos. And there's this like seven foot player, you know, he has huge hands. The fact that the seven foot guy with hands this big, or building little tiny Legos, which is like hilarious to me. And, you know, the, the Nets right now are a huge team, obviously. Like, I found out that, you know, a lot of times I just go in the locker room and I look in people's lockers, not like snoopingly, but just like it's available to you, right? Just like Lane Whitter could told me if someone says, here's my number, call me whenever. If you're in a locker room and there's nothing covering the locker, like fair game to look at. I saw all these Nets players had smoothies in their lockers. I'm like, sure enough, there was this whole story about, the Nets smoothie club and every little player had their different individual habits and whatnot. And like two years later, that, that smoothie went viral on, on Twitter because Kyrie Irving had one at a press conference. And I saw my Twitter mentions, there were Nets fans tweeting at me. Oh, this Jake Fisher has the story from two years ago. These smoothies are this. So I kind of made a niche for myself in the league with fans, with media and with people in the NBA that I was always looking for different type stories. Like, I was in Vegas summer league one summer um, on the arena con course in the Thomas and Mack center. And this executive came up to me and said, you know, I, I had the next Jake Fisher story for you. I was like, Oh, awesome. He said, you know, Nick nurse just got hired to be the head coach of the Toronto Raptors. This was the summer of 2018. Um, he's a really damn good coach. He's had a crazy career. He started in Britain, went all over Europe. Like you got to write about this guy before they win the title. So I flew up to Toronto and did this whole story about this guy's unique background and how he's like an East musician and all this stuff. And he like learned from artists left and right and coaches and doctors. And I'm like, sure enough, the rappers win the title that year. And when the sports illustrated puts out their commemorative issue about that championship team, my story is in there. Um, so I developed this niche over the years. I was at SI after I graduated um, from 20, I was there pretty much from 2015, to 2019, um, and it was an incredible platform. Like when you, when you call someone up and say, I'm with Sports Illustrated, that door typically opens, it opens a lot of doors. It might not. Um, but, you know, I still was kind of facing a bit of upward, uh, I was a bit of like pushback in terms of trying to grow my career. There it was a very like old boys club type of environment. Um, and I was realizing that I was going to have to wait my turn a lot longer than I wanted to. Um, and there were other opportunities popping up here and there that just weren't, they never, nothing really felt like the right fit to leave Sports Illustrated for because of how good the platform was. So I thought to myself at a certain point, um, you know, I know, I, I know I'm good at finding these stories and people appreciate my work. Like, I think what I can do in my free time is start working on something for myself and show what I really am capable of. And like a year, like, 2018-ish, 2017, a year or two before I left SI, um, I started working on this book. And it's kind of like a collection and an ode, I think, of all the lessons and the people that I met and learned from um, throughout the start of my career. Because 
while I was doing all that, you know, one theme I've ignored so far is that um, when, when Sam Hankey got hired to run the Philadelphia 76ers in 2013, right at the onset of my career, you know, the process and rebuilding in Philly was the most polarizing thing in professional sports, let alone basketball. I was from Philly. I was an aspiring sports writer. Like it just became not like my identity, but something I had to talk about all the time. People in the NBA, my dad's friends, other people, everyone wanted me to either give them my opinion or give them some insight onto the book uh, or onto the process, excuse me. So it just seemed like something that was palpably polarizing and not many things are really polarizing, right? Like a lot of things are controversial. So these be polarizing to truly either have people be in favor of you or it or against it is a rare thing. And that's what was happening in Philly. So I started, it was something that I kind of had an identity built around. I was from Philly and was able to talk about that. And I wanted to uncover more information about those years with the approach that I've always taken, you know, talking about the people in place. Like Sam Hinkie is this caricature of like a nerdy computer guy. He's never watched basketball, but I, um, you know, wanted to bring the person and the, and the boss and the dad into that character of him. And, you know, I really have an understanding of how, you know, the NBA is this ecosystem where, you know, agent players are just trying to make the team, make their money, win a little bit and cement their legacy. Agents are just trying to get their clients as much money as possible to set themselves up personally and also to have a track record where they can sign more agents, more players in the future. Coaches are also trying to advance themselves. But they're trying to do that mostly by proving they can win. And executives are all trying to build a team in order to do so um, and ultimately compete for a championship as well. And what happened at that time with Hinky um, coming to power in Philly at the same time, also Phoenix hired Ryan McDonough from Boston's front office in to run the Suns. Um, the Orlando Magic had, had already hired Rob Hennigan. The Kings hired this guy named Pete D'Alessandro, who was like a lawyer. Um, David Griffin was this analytical minded executive running the Cleveland Cavaliers and in all these small markets, the math and the analytics suggested that the only way to really compete and build cha- and win a championship team is to actually be really bad. Like the heat were running the league at that time because they had LeBron, Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. And the only way to build a team that can compete, that can compete against the caliber uh, of players like that Miami team is to either draft them sign them in free agency or trade for them. The easiest way to trade for them and sign them in free agency is if you have one already. So look at that Miami team. The Heat drafted Dwayne Wade. They did a good enough job to build a contender around him. They won it in 2006. And they kept building around him to the point where Dwayne Wade brought other superstars on the top of that draft to Miami with him. So the only way to get your Dwayne Wade or to even get your LeBron or Chris Bosh in the first place is to get a high draft pick the only way to get a high draft pick is to be bad on purpose. So that kind of really happened partially because teams really did want to avoid being smacked around by the heat. They figured well, we'll be bad on purpose. We'll get our guys a couple of years down the road. Like we're seeing now, you know, Philly obviously has Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. Boston has Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. You know, Phoenix didn't think they would do it with their number 13 pick, but Devin Booker is the guy who's kind of made that team rise again. Um, but it compares a lot of teams also. There's a lot with the Lakers in there as well. They were really, really bad for a while, if you guys don't recall, um, in Kobe's last years. They're kind of mixed in to be the independent variable of that because uh, they were the, the big market, the glitzy city that they are that, that can get, you know, a superstar player anyway. Um, but they were, I mean, they were the, they're the most poorly handled and managed team all throughout Kobe's last couple of years, all throughout this tanking era. Um, and they still end up getting LeBron. And then Anthony Davis, just like we talked about, the, the, the Lakers partially were able to trade for Anthony Davis because LeBron was already in L.A. But most teams aren't the Lakers. Most teams, like the Minnesota Timberwolves right now, for example, they, we talk about them a little bit in the book where Kevin Love is their franchise guy. He was an MVP candidate. All of a sudden, he tells Flip Saunders at the time their team president, I want to leave your franchise. I want to go compete for a title. The, the Timberwolves had the, a top five MVP candidate before they traded Kevin Love that summer. The next season, they got the number one pick. They were the worst team in the draft. 
So that, that kind of goes to show how quick and how fickle things can be in the NBA, but also how important superstars are. Like a, a, one guy can, he can keep you in the mix of competing for titles. And the second he leaves, look at the Houston Rockets right now. They had James Harden forever. They trade James Harden. They are one of, if not the worst teams in the league to this day. And I think that just goes to show the calculus behind why tanking to get these guys is so important. And I wanted to highlight all these different teams because it is an inexact science and there were different approaches to it. I don't think there's necessarily one correct way to do so because I also think team building is unique to the players and the people in mind, um, which we can definitely talk about some more examples of that. Um, if people have specific questions moving forward um, about what's in the book. Um, but there's details from, you know, the Sixers very famously traded for New Orleans Noel um, with Drew Holiday to kind of start that process era um, in 2013. And New Orleans was injured that whole season. That's why he fell to number six in that draft. And there was a whole debate um, in Philadelphia that season where, you know, he was not showing up on time to medical training he was late to the team playing a couple of times. They were like sitting at the, on the tarmac waiting to take off for a road trip for some 19 year old kid to show up late. Um, so there was debate in that franchise from Hinky to Brett Brown to other people, the security staff about legitimately hiring a full-time like babysitter for him to make sure he got places on time, which, you know, is difficult being that partially you got to think about how this 19 year old kid, you drafted him to be your next LeBron. You need to treat him as such as well. But he is 19, and this is also partially why I wanted to write the book. I was 19 at that time too, right? So my age and relating with those players, it kind of helped me get an understanding of what was happening. So they went from, um, you know, deciding to whether or not hire a babysitter for him to they end up, like, finding him pink slips. They'd write the amount and put it on his chair in the locker room, and every time it increased by $500. And one day, Nerlens just walked in the room, and a player, Brandon Davies, on that team told me he just watched Nerlens brush off the pile and watched the pink paper fall like confetti onto the ground. So there are little stories like that to, like, Brad Stevens, when he got hired in Boston, um, I found out he brought a coach with him. He used to play for him at Butler, this guy Ron Norred, who's now a, co a coach with the Charlotte Hornets. But uh, Norred lived in, in Brad Stevens' basement that year. He had Brad Stevens had his wife and his kids upstairs, and this guy who coached with him or he played with him in Butler now is a coach on his staff, was living in his basement. And he would come up, Ron Nora would come upstairs every night, join the family for dinner. They would listen to music in the background while eating dinner, which is something I try to get my family to do, but they always resist. Um, and, you know, afterwards they play Racco, this card game that maybe some of you are familiar with. And Brad would get so competitive, and when he'd win, he would sign the paper that he they would keep score with, with his autograph, like he was autographing a, a painting he just made. So there's little human interest stories like that versus you know, I can really spin it forward and, and bring you inside war rooms and, and, and conversations teams are having on the clock where like, you know, the Sacramento Kings in 2013 were going to take uh, CJ McCollum at number seven in that draft. And obviously for those who, are, who know, CJ McCollum has become, a very, very good player, borderline all-star candidate. At the time, the Kings were just dying to find a point guard to pair with DeMarcus Cousins. He was their big man of the future, and they thought he was their piece to, to contend, and they needed to pair him with a guy like C.J. McCollum. But their one condition was, if Ben McElmore was still available, they were going to take Ben McElmore number seven. Ben McElmore was a point guard, or, or a shooting guard, excuse me, at Kansas that year, a freshman, a young player. Um, C.J. McCollum was a little bit older. So Macklemore probably had a bit theoretically more higher, higher of an upside. Um, but, you know, all the, he was a number one pick candidate at some point too, but all the intel at the time was bad, bad on Ben Macklemore. He'd showed up to Phoenix late. He left his sneakers behind and didn't show up without sneakers in Orlando. So he kept falling down the board. And that was the one condition that Sacramento was going to take, was not going to take CJ McCollum. They were going to take CJ McCollum unless – See, uh, ben McElmore was available. Sure enough, they take Ben McElmore. He, and then ben McElmore actually just got signed today on a 10-day contract with the Lakers. But he's like kind of out of the league at this point. CJ McCollum, you know, is still an all-star caliber player. So who knows? If the Kings were to take CJ McCollum, you know, maybe they would have created a big man, little man duo with DeMarcus Cousins for a decade, just like CJ has made that pairing with Damian Lillard in Portland. So 
that's kind of the 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 other under the spectrum from the human side to the transactional side and um i can't believe i made it 45 minutes but here that's where we are so if you guys have any more uh questions i'm uh, I'm, I'm all ears all right so if anybody has any questions for jake uh, by the way, the 76ers are beating the uh, Celtics at the moment at 59-46 at halftime. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm yeah, thanks, Mark. That. Yeah, you you are, that was for you, David. Crowley. I know, I know, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. We have a couple things actually um, up here. So and, and it was really funny, um, Jake. By the way, I was a sports editor of the East Side in 1987. Oh, were you? I was. I did not know that. Uh, there you go. Very but nice. Gagliardi wasn't my guy. It was uh, Tony yeah. Smith at that time. Well, the, the archives are still there. Gag. Well, I, very, I uh, actually have a bunch of mine. So there you go. I, I probably I probably have them somewhere too. Yeah. So there you go. Um, so uh, Leticia Acosta is very proud of you. Um, <laughs> that's uh, in the chat. Did you ever meet Jerry Innsberg, New York sports writer? And Marty Barron from the Boston Globe. I did meet Marty Barron one time. Um, it was when Spotlight was coming out. He came to Northeastern to kind of do his media tour, but also um, they, I mean, again, like one of these lucky things, um, they picked me to be one of like the 10 students who got to sit at some round table with him. And um, par I think partially because I was a Globe employee at the time too. And he was just like, he is Lev Schreiber in, in that movie Spotlight. Like he is the epitome of a capital J curmudgeon -y guy who is just trying to get the facts and the story straight and tell the truth and do things that create change. Like definitely like that that portrayal of him in the movie is spot on. Okay. Uh, from Rob Lipka, uh, were you in the bubble last year? And if so, what was it like? I actually know the answer to that already. <laughs> yeah, I was not in the bubble. Um, but I can give you some inside info on that being that for any media member who was there, their platform, their magazine, whatever, had to pay like 50 grand to do it, um, which is pretty nuts. Um, I don't, I honestly don't think it was worth anybody paying that fee to do it. But um, yeah, I've heard some crazy stories. And I know a lot of people who were in that bubble, um, both in the media and the NBA side. I have friends who were there for the NBA bubble and the G League bubble. It seems like something that... Um, was a very cool experience that won't get replicated again but i also i'm kind of happy i spent the pandemic in my apartment writing this book and like <laughs> hanging out and not being uh not being trapped in a hotel room a little bit so alan writes what kind of personality does 76ers owner josh harris have in hmm. um have um in person away from um the business well, my only interactions with him have been in the business sense. They've been like off the record, I guess. Um, but definitely still like while he's wearing that team owner hat. Um, I will say like candidly, he always sounds drunk, which is I think you guys see that as it is right now. Um, and, you know, when you're a billionaire, maybe you can be. Um, he, he's a rambly type talker. Um, he definitely like I can tell he's thinking um what not to say when he talks if, if that if that makes sense uh you can catch my drift there um and he kind of wants to like make things he's always it seems like he's always trying to spin something into his way that's been my uh perception of him um but obviously he's been a magnate and he's made a lot of money so i can't really argue with uh his operating procedures uh, Nick's have been bad. Uh, uh, Dean uh, has asked this question. Nick's have been bad for decades due to the ownership of uh, Mr. Dolan. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, a big part of the book is talking about how big a role that ownership plays for, in every you know team decision making process. But really, also to decide to be bad for one year, let alone multiple years, is obviously pretty antithetical to what the league is, right? The, the game is about winning and the league is about winning championships. So to do that, you know, you really need ownership approval. Um, and we see that in Sacramento in the book with Vivek Ranadive. You know, he came into the fold right when Sam did. And there's crazy, crazy stories in the book about him, you know, firing an assistant coach just to prove a point. And he wanted them to play four on five at one point. He gave the coaching staff just like, 
excuse me, absurd benchmarks. Like they were a really bad team in 2014-15. And before the 15-16 season, he wanted them to become a 50-win team. Like random stuff like that. And that was like a closed-door meeting. Um, so to bring that back to the Knicks, like obviously James Dolan has gotten – in the way of them, that team being competent and making strong decision making for you know the last decade or so, even they're not really that big of a part of the book. But that Christoph Porzingis selection with Phil Jackson, like they they drafted Porzingis, it was a great pick. They always had good drafts, but that the way Porzingis's career ended up in New York is a complete you know manifestation of how that old regime would just flub things left and right I mean they the deal has kind of looked pretty good for them that trade but they definitely traded him thinking they were getting Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving and they have Julius Randle who is an all-star but he's not those guys but I will say from talking to people this year with the Knicks around the Knicks I have a couple of friends on that coaching staff in the front office um and Leon Rose is the cherry hole guy like many guy. people probably know too went to my alma mater played in my program is now their general manager um, you know, I haven't talked to Leon in a long time since he was my uh, spring league coach back in high school. Um, but, you know, by all account, I did talk to his son, Sam, who's an agent at CAA last week. Um, but um, by all accounts, the Knicks are running the franchise now. Like you'd want an analytically smart minded team to do so. I mean, they've had these first round picks from that Porzingis trade that they could have gone after Victor or Depot for or Andre Drummond for, or you name it. And they haven't yet. They've been patient. Um, they want to ride this thing out slowly and not make any, you know, egregious big errors early on. So it, we'll see. They're going to have a lot of cap room this summer. And depending on how this playoff run works, um, it'll, it'll probably set the tone for a lot of things. But for now, I'm definitely as like an objective observer, like I'm more bullish on the Knicks this year than I have been in a long time. Yeah. Okay. Um, David uh, Aaron's wanted to let you know that uh, it was a fascinating talk. Well done. Thank you very um, much. Our international president, Tom right. Sudo, uh, wants to know, do you think the lack of competitiveness of many teams in the NBA hurts the league? Yeah. I mean, right now, the way that, I mean, there are teams losing by 40, 50 points every night, like this week. Um the Thunder are terrible. The Pistons are really, really bad. The Houston Rockets are really bad. The Magic just traded their three best players very, very publicly and famously in, you know, a couple weeks ago to be bad too. Um, and while it's smart for those franchises, like I write it in the book and I'll say it now, the way the rules are comprised, it benefits teams to be bad on purpose to get a high draft pick. It just does. Um, but, you know, when it's that widespread, like I, I really do think, I'm not just saying this because it's very, you know, kitschy for my book. Like this is it's it's the worst it's been the worst being you know, teams being bad that it was since that 2013-14 season that this book really uh, stems around because um, this draft in 2021 is considered to be the next you know 2014 type class the next 2003 type class um, I'm not really as plugged in with the draft right now as I used to be but these names Evan Mobley Cade Cunningham Jalen Suggs was in the title game last night they're all considered to be these guys. But it's not good for the NBA if there are six teams every night who aren't don't have a shot at winning. And especially because, again, the business of the NBA is competing to win the title. That is what the whole thing is built around. It's the business is not built around building teams. So it does hurt the league's bottom line at a certain point. And I do think that they would be better off if the lottery system or if – the draft order just in general was disassociated from record. I, I, I think that they need to do that in order to get rid of tanking and that would be better for the league. Cool. Uh, what is, what is, a, uh, what arena is the friendliest for sports writers? Hmm. Well, that's, that's a, a loaded question because there's a lot of factors at play. There's like the actual seat, there's the team PR staff and how good they are and welcome. And then there's team security. Like, the security at the garden is awful. Like as much as every time I actually put my two feet onto the garden court and look up and like, you're there, it's really cool. But to get there from the front door is a nightmare. And they, they, they push you around like you're in a prison camp, honestly. Um, and the security guards love to hold on to that little bit of power that they have and steer you certain directions. 
Um, I did always love going to Boston Garden or TD Garden. Like in college, the media the media meal was incredible, first of all, and the seating was pretty good. There was um, a section right in the corner, and also there was one like behind the basket that was kind of free. Um, like anyone in media could sit there, and the, and the Celtics PR staff was great. Um, maybe I'm a little biased because I was I spent so much time there, um, but that crowd was really good too. You know, Mark mentioned like my Boston New York Philly stuff. Um, you know, I've I've lived in all three areas, and um, you know everyone says you know it's different here. It's Boston. It's New York. It's Philly. It's all the same. It's just a different type of person. Um, you know, different types of backgrounds. But every city has the same like blue collar. We're, you're not from here. It's different here. Um, Boston's crowd is just is just like that too. Um, from when I grew up with. And uh, it's a little bit different flavor, but it's a good it's a good spot for sure. All right, we got a couple more before we. It's almost uh, it's eight fifty seven. But um, how hard uh, is it to be? Um, h- how hard is it on a superstar like Steph Curry um, to be on such a terrible team right now, losing by over fifty points uh, this past week? Yeah, it's from Josh, Josh Feinblum. Huh. Hey, Josh. Josh does my bar mitzvah tutor. Um, there you go. Fun <laughs> fact for everybody. Um, I mean, the, the Warriors the whole franchise feels the pressure that like this guy is a two time MVP and he's slipping out of his prime and we need to compete, you know, as soon as we can before he, he loses, you know, this, this peak of his powers. Uh, I'm sure he's frustrated. I'm sure I haven't talked to Steph about it, but I mean, for, I know a lot of people in the organization and they're, you know, the Warriors were the Warriors. They were just puffy, you know, we're, you know, light years ahead of everybody else is what their owner said to the New York Times. Um, they definitely still kind of operate like they are that, but knowing that people don't think that way about them anymore. So that, I think that's leaked throughout the entire organization, yeah. Okay, and one of the last ones. Oh, and another one over there. Um, Chicago Bulls traded uh, two number one picks for, for Nikola Vucevic. Um, the team is off, has often traded number one picks, hasn't worked. What do you think of this trade um, gave up Wendell Carter? So they were looking to move Wendell Carter around the draft back in November. So I wasn't surprised that he went out the door. Um, and also, I, I, I know um, the president of that team now, Torres Karnasovas, a little bit. I spent some time with him in Denver. Um, November 2019, I flew out to Denver because um, I knew they'd be like a good team and had some interesting stories. Um, and I got, I went to lunch with him. Um, he was very complimentary of Israeli women for interested people, people interested in that nugget. Um, he told me, he always told his son to marry a, 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 a IDF Navy officer. Um, he's a, he's a really um, thoughtful guy in terms of like team building and um, like analytics and whatever, but he also wants to win. And, um, you know, the Bulls theoretically will be a playoff team over these, over these next couple of years. So trading, you know, first round pick, the, the, and people really talk about this too, like the, the, the optical value of a first round pick is always higher typically than it really is, right? Like once you're, once that pick isn't a first round pick and it's number 17, you know, a first round pick, you start in your head thinking, oh, maybe it's a top five, maybe it's, you know, number one. But when it turns out to be like 18, it's not nearly as valuable. Um, so I think it was fair value, value for Vucevic, um, you know, will it work out? The question remains to be seen. He's 30 and centers typically once they go past 30 tend to have a drop off statistically, but his his game isn't really based off athleticism. It's finesse and shooting and being smart and making good reads with the ball in his hands. So I'm bullish on it. I know my friends in that organization are, are pretty excited about it. So, um, I mean, they got to do some work here. They're like the seven seed, I think still the nine seed. They got to really improve to make it pay off, but I think it could be a good trade for sure. Okay, uh, David and Danny, it's nine o'clock. Uh, there's okay. a, uh, I didn't know. There's one more. Uh, Go for it. Ask the last one. It's fine. That's the last one. How the okay? How the um, the overall? Oh, hold on, I just one. How the overall league? How is the league doing in maintaining the franchises uh, when COVID has affected the number of those attending the games, um, and how are they making money? Well, I think they're doing anything they can for advertising sponsorships. Um, I mean, there's more and more 
things with uh, um, a partnership on like I see on TV, like in the background, I see like in a press releases I get like, you know, today's player of the week award brought to you by whatever they've done everything they can to flex their muscles in terms of getting the little different advertising deals they can. Um, and we saw it already that they had, I mean, they previewed that mindset, I think with the Jersey patches, um, but even like the all-star game, like the league is making money. That is their goal. And the all-star game only happened because TNT had a lucrative um, rights deal with the league to operate it. They viewed TNT to use that as a marquee event to get, you know, to sell commercial real estate to other people. Um, so the league is doing whatever they can to make a 72 games happen because that's a certain number that they need to get their money back from all the local rights deals and to satisfy um, ESPN and TNT for their rights agreements, but also they're trying to pour and extract as much advertising partnerships as they can. Okay. So um, I put in the chat, if anybody is, um, you know, would like to order Jake's book, I put the link in for um, Amazon. You can click on that. It's, um, it's, you can do a Kindle, the hardcover, um, but it's there if you uh, want to order it. Yeah. Um, and um, Jake, thank you again for being here. Um, and thank you thank for, you for you know, our me. conversations that we've had over the past couple of weeks. So I truly appreciated yeah. it. So let me throw I it to Danny. You. Okay. Can I, make, can, can, can I make one more sales pitch for the book? Sure. So yeah, thank you for thank, thank you for putting the link. I appreciate that. Um, my big sales pitch is that you know, from everything you guys have heard, this will make sense. And you know, the book cost twenty something dollars, so I wanted to make sure that it was worth people's money. Um, and I really do think it's three hundred twenty pages. I really do think that ninety percent of it is either new information or that's never been reported before, like not not public at all or it's furthered information from certain things that have become a little bit public. So if you're a basketball fan, if you're a sports fan, um, if you like little, little gossip and nitty gritty things behind the scenes, pretty much every, sing every single page, there's multiple things that you're going to find out new for the first time that I'm really excited for people to finally get to find out. It's been a long journey. So if you have the interest in buying it, I'd appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you, Jake. So uh, a few things. Uh, Number one, you're uh, my son's age, who's also in the sports business. So uh, okay. he would be very envious. He, he ain't one of his jobs for the Red Sox, so he's uh, working tonight. But so, Yashikach uh, to you and all your success. Thank you. Very, very, very nice. Um, Thank you very much. So, we've had three sports webinars in the past three weeks, and they've all been terrific and they've all been a little different, and we've learned a lot uh, th throughout. Uh, we will have one more uh, in May, um, but then we're actually taking a little hiatus because June 6th, this is very self-serving, yes. So between June 6th <coughs> and June 13th, where the Federation of Jewish Men's Club is having a virtual convention. So Jake, even though you might not know this, we were supposed to go to Chicago for an in-person yeah. convention, but because of COVID, we had to reschedule. So if you liked the webinars, you'll love the convention. So we have two <laughs> things already that we're lining up. Um, one is Harold Katz, also known as Chaim Katz. And if you were with us a few weeks ago with Tamir Goodman, he was their coach. So he's going to tell us all about coaching. And, and there's a new hot shout that he's coaching now um, that could be the first Orthodox Jewish NBA player if they work around that Shabbos issue. So uh, we're also talking to Tal Brody, Israel ambassador to basketball and a former NBA player. And so that just gives you a taste of what the virtual convention is all about. So if you haven't already signed up, it's June 6th to June 13th. And you, if you haven't gotten an invite, you can go on to the FJMC uh, website and it's right there for you. So a lot more to come. Yeshikoach to uh, Mark. Mark, thank you so much for getting us Jake tonight. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And it was uh, great to get a different perspective, not just a Boston. Well, you did give us kind of a Boston <laughs> perspective because you did go to Northeastern. And I'd be very curious to know about your comments about mixed feelings about Northeastern. Very, very interesting. <laughs> and Dan Shaughnessy up here, I live in Newton and he, he lives in Newton. He's a pretty much a, a, a legend. He's an interesting guy. 
Uh, he's so, a, he's so, a very nice guy too. Yeah, yeah. He he does, he doesn't take himself too seriously, so that's really nice. No. So, all right. Um, so I'm just going to end it by uh, turning it over to my partner who works tirelessly on these webinars, Mr. Dave Kravitz. Thank you, Danny. So first of all, I want to thank Danny, my coach Hammond. He he's my guy. He he really worked together really well, uh, and it's a lot of fun working with Danny. We have a great time. Um, Elliot Feldman is our coach Hammond. And our chairman, rather. And I'd like to thank Mark Cohen for getting Jake Fisher. I really, really appreciate your work. He did a phenomenal job tonight. Very, very impressive. I want to thank, thank you. you. For, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us for the program this evening. I want to thank you to our speaker, Jake Fisher. Um, I'm a real basketball fan. So for me, it's fun. Anything to do basketball, I am all in on. And I was very entertained for every single moment. So it was absolutely phenomenal. So our next event is going to be May 4th. And you guys really want to be on this one. Um, gentleman is Adam Edelman, or A.J. Edelman. He is known as the Hebrew Hammer. He is the captain of the Israeli bobsled team. Yes, there is an Israeli bobsled team. And he is a four-time Israel national champion in the skeleton event, which we'll explain all about. And he happens to be the first um, Orthodox uh, Jew ever to participate in the Winter Olympics. He has a phenomenal story. You don't want to miss this. So I want to thank you and I'll look forward to seeing you in our next program. And if you enjoyed our program this evening, please make a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. The link is in the chat. Thank you. Hey, Dave, just tell them as we conclude what Tom, Tom Sudo has recommended you for the next Israeli blaps of team. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go there. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Jake.